So welcome everybody. My name, for those of you uh, who don't know me, is I'm David Wilkins. I'm a professor of law here. I'm the faculty director of the Center on the Legal Profession. And this is uh, a speaker series, which we have uh, about uh, two or three times per semester, in which we try to bring interesting people who are doing interesting things related to the legal profession to campus. And uh, for those of you uh, who would like to, there's something that'll circulate around which you can sign up so we can make sure we notify you. Um, we, uh, as I say, we do this about uh, maybe four or five times over the course of the year. And uh, we always provide free lunch, so uh, you, at a minimum, you will be well fed, but you'll also be intellectually well fed as well, because we uh, have people who are working in different parts of the legal profession uh, on different kinds of problems that you might not otherwise get exposed to. And we think it's a great way to help students um, both engage with interesting lawyers in different parts of the profession and also to think a little bit about how you might want your career to unfold. Um, we also, as you can see by this big sign, uh, publish a digital magazine. It's called The Practice. It comes out six times a year. And its goal is kind of to be somewhere between, I don't know, the Harvard Law Review, which is my view, nobody reads. And not, you know, not even when I write in it, do I read it. Uh, and the American Lawyer, which uh, no one should believe, or at least no one should take too seriously. And there's nothing in between, right? There's nothing in business. You have like the Harvard Business Review, or you have the Economist, or the Atlantic. You know, serious publications that try to take serious issues, but make it accessible and readable to ordinary uh, practitioners and people. That's our goal with the practice. Um, we take on all sorts of issues. Uh, we did one on the professional identity formulation of young lawyers like you. How do you think about your professional identity in relation to other parts of your identity? Uh, we've done uh, ones on the globalization of pro bono. We just did one on uh, the Brazilian legal profession based on some research that we, a uh, book we just published on the Brazilian legal profession in the age of globalization. What's the next uh, issue on? Asian Americans. On Asian Americans. Some of you may have seen Goodwin Liu, who uh, had, was here, uh, has done a really excellent study on Asian Americans and the law, something that really is not studied, I think, nearly enough. So just to give you some idea, every student here, if you have a, or every faculty member, Professor Kennedy, if you have a Harvard ID, you're entitled to a free subscription. You just have to go and claim it. And we'd love to have uh, a Yale ID. You got to pay, but <laughs> uh, pay double. No, but we hope that Yale actually, does Yale have an institutional subscription? So Steve, we hope that when you go back, you will tell Yale the Yale Law Library costs 1500 bucks, and then every Yale student would also get access. It would be as smart or almost as smart as their first priority. Yeah, thank you. But my first priority is to stop plugging our own publications and to, pub and to plug yours, because my good friend Steve Carter, who I've known, uh, I won't say how many many years, but uh, I first met him when he was clerking for Justice Marshall the year before I did, and we were doing the transition, and it was clear to me at that time that I would never quite measure up to the level of law clerk that the justice had had before, and I've spent my whole career not measuring up to Steve over the years. Uh, as many of you know, he's a prolific author, written on many, many subjects. Uh, including, uh, if you haven't seen it, a fantastic work of uh, fiction called the uh, murder mystery called The Emperor of Ocean Park, which still I think is the best murder mystery ever written about Martha's Vineyard. Uh, but he's turned his attention now to a really fascinating uh, story of history, but not just of history generally, but of his own family history. Uh, the book is called Invisible. I'm not going to say much about it. I'll let Steve uh, introduce it, but I will say that there is a table outside this room, and at the conclusion of uh, Steve's talk, uh, we hope you will all rush out there and buy several copies and give away as Christmas presents to your friends.
Um, Steve, as you may have undoubtedly figured out, is a professor at that other uh, law school where he has been, I think, since leaving Justice Marshall's. Uh, I, I, I did practice for one year. One year, okay. Uh, but, uh, and has really been an influential figure on uh, many, many, many issues. But my guess is that nothing has been quite as personal as writing this book. So without further ado, Steve Carr. Thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, it is a great pleasure uh, to be here. And I thank David Wilkins for the invitation. I'm here with my daughter, uh, Leah Carter, uh, also a graduate of that other <laughs> law school who practiced law for several years, but then took time off to be the principal researcher on this book. So we're both going to do part of the talking because she knows as much about a lot of the details, and in some cases more, uh, than, uh, than I do. So we're going to switch off a couple of times in this, uh, in this process. We're going to try to be brief because I want to open this to questions and, and so on. I, I, I want to work backward in a sense. Uh, the subject of the book is a woman named Eunice Carter, who was indeed my grandmother. But I didn't know anything about these things that she had done when she was alive. She died when I was a young teenager. And, uh, I knew her mainly as this scary old woman who was always correcting our grammar and correcting which fork we, uh, uh, we used when we, when we ate. And only after working on this book and understanding what she had done a long, long time ago did I understand, come to understand that what I had seen as, a, as intimidation was really the kind of fortitude uh, that she needed to accomplish the things that she did. I, I want to just take a quick minute and set the scene for the principal story in the book. You have to go back to New York of the 1930s, a deeply segregated city at a time when the legal profession itself was uh, deeply segregated. As some of you probably know, the American Bar Association, for example, uh, at that time had a rule against having uh, black members, a rule that it adopted after accidentally admitting two black members a few years earlier. The rule was not uh, abolished until the late 1940s, and they didn't admit another black member until the 1950s. So that's the great, um, I have other stories about the Arab Bar Association that I won't share. But you have to picture this legal profession. So here is Eunice Carter, uh, who comes along and wants to be a lawyer, of all things. She'd earlier actually been a writer and had been involved with the Harlem Renaissance. And, published uh, a lot of short stories and reviews uh, and essays. She she wants to be a lawyer. All right. Now, Harlem at this time, where she was living, was basically run by the mob. The mob ran much of New York, particularly ran Harlem, which was the most lucrative mob territory in America, largely because of the numbers game, uh, which not only was played more heavily in Harlem than anywhere else, but also employed uh, more Harlemites than any other industry. Somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people in Harlem worked in the illegal uh, numbers game. So there have been these mob wars over the control of Harlem. And basically, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, the black gangs that are traditionally run Harlem were forced out by a coalition of white ethnic mobs that took over uh, Harlem. Meanwhile, with, uh, with uh, gang violence uh, becoming more and more common elsewhere in New York, the reformers, the newspapers, and so on were demanding that someone do something about it because the New York District Attorney's Office, which is completely corrupt, never prosecuted anybody, any serious uh, mobster at all. So in the mid-1930s, actually, they had what was called the runaway grand jury in New York, where the a grand jury of 27 people that had been impaneled to make newspapers happy by investigating illegal gambling kicked the, so the assistant district attorney out of the room and sent a note to the judge saying they would not deal with anyone from the New York City Attorney's Office because they felt the office was corrupt. <laughs> and so they demanded, well, they demanded, they, <coughs> they asked, is there a way of getting someone else to prosecute organized crime in New York? That's the note they sent to the judge. So this became uh, public. Uh, and finally, the, the uh, foreman of the jury, of the grand jury, met with the governor of New York, Governor Lehman. And the governor went public and demanded that the New York District Attorney, who was a completely corrupt man named William Dodge, appoint a special prosecutor. So Dodge did so. He appointed one of his, his corrupt cronies as a special prosecutor. 
and he announced to the press that the grand jurors were happy with his choice, which they weren't. Then the grand jurors started giving interviews and saying, no, we don't like, we didn't, this isn't the guy we wanted at all. So finally, the governor uh, said to the mayor, I'm going to give you a list of four people, and you have to pick one of these four people to be the special prosecutor, or else I'm going to have the attorney general of the state investigate your office. So uh, the, the DA caved, and he went to each of the four people on the list, and they all turned it down. They all turned it down because no one would be associated with the corruption in the office. So the governor finally turned to Thomas Dewey, who of course would later famously run for president, uh, and Dewey had actually been the first choice of the Bar Association. The Bar, but, but the governor had left him off the list, apparently because historians today think the governor knew this was a guy with political ambition. He'd been a very successful prosecutor before. He was a very successful New York lawyer in private practice, and the governor didn't want to raise his profile. All right, so finally, Dewey was selected. And Dewey made a, made a bunch of demands. He wanted his own office, his own budget, his own assistance. He wanted no one who had any connection with Dodge's corrupt office. He got all those things. So then he hired 20 lawyers, and the press began to write about them. And they were called the 20 Against the Underworld. That's what the press called them. And they were announced the great fanfare in August of 1935. And there were 19 white males <laughs> and one black woman. Those were the 20 Against the Underworld. And because the black woman who no one had ever heard of was a man bites dog story, she was the news. The New York Times, for example, published only her photograph when it had the list of grand, uh, uh, of, and, and papers from New York to California ran headlines, Dewey hires Negro. That's what, that, that was the headline all over the country. Uh, no one knew who this woman was. She'd come out of, uh, out of nowhere. Uh, anyway, so she gets hired, make a long story short, she, get, she gets hired uh, to, uh, to work on this case. And then the following events occur. In this private hidden office, which is heavily guarded and so on, there are 20 cubicles, one for each of the assistants. Uh, and there's a long hallway. And the closer you are to one end of the hallway, the closer you are to the seat of the power, Dewey's office. The other end of the hallway was where the cops hung out, and it was the less prestigious end of the hallway. Needless to say, Eunice Carter, the black woman he hired, was put down at the far end of the hallway next to the cops. Then the investigations began, and Dewey announced that he was not going to prosecute organized crime for anything except serious offenses. And the 19 white males in the office are working on loan sharking, political corruption, smuggling, drugs, murder. They're all looking into that. Alone in your office at the far end of the corridor, the one woman and the one black woman, the one black person, is given prostitution to work on. Now, you have to understand that there were not very many prosecutors who were women at all in America at the time, but virtually all of them ended up being assigned to the so-called women's courts, which, meant, which were places that tried basically prostitution, child abandonment, and a few other offenses, and that was widely seen as a graveyard from which no female prosecutor's career ever recovered. If you're a woman and you worked for the prosecutor, that was where you got sent all over the country. Well, Eunice was never a women's court prosecutor. That wasn't her job, but she did look into prostitution because when Dewey opened his office and he said to New Yorkers, come to the office, you can tell us in confidence what is worrying you about the mob, he expected people to show up with the stories of loan sharking and murder. But one person after another came and said, Prostitution, prostitution, there's a brothel on the corner, there's this going on in my neighborhood, there's that going on in my neighborhood. Someone had to look into it, so he took the one woman on his staff and gave it to her. So she got all the prostitution stuff, which is a crime that Dewey made clear to the news he was not going to prosecute. He told reporters over and over again, I'm not here to try vice cases, because that was unpopular and he wanted to run for, for governor and maybe, uh, and maybe more. So here's Eunice when all these other attorneys in the office are trying, are, are working on all these other things, she's sitting on with just doing prostitution and nothing else. But here's what happened. That this fortitude I was talking about a moment ago, that Dewey didn't reckon with, that her view wasn't, well, I guess I'm stuck here. Her view was maybe there's something to this. And she spent about four months building a case that nobody believed in, a case that prostitution in 
New York was actually run by the mob, which no one even believed was true. Dewey's own idea was that the brothels in New York were all independent contractors, let's say, with no central apparatus. Eunice believed otherwise, and long story short, eventually proved that it was true. That is to say, she could create enough evidence that she was able to go to Dewey, who was very frustrated because no other of the nine, none of the 19 white male assistants had come up with any crime that was provable against Lucky Luciano, the man who he was trying to take down. She was able to present evidence gleaned largely from interviews with women who worked in prostitution, but also a lot of it gleaned from records of prostitution that had been kept by various social service organizations in New York over the years no one had ever looked at. She was able to glean a significant amount of evidence that the mob actually ran prostitution in New York. So on February 1st, 1936, uh, Dewey allowed her to organize a raid of 80 houses of prostitution uh, in New York. The night before, they arrested people they knew from wiretap evidence were, were known as the fixers, whose job was to get these women out of jail if they were ever arrested. They were all, the fixers were all quietly arrested. And on February 1st, they arrested, the number isn't unclear, but well over 100 of women who worked in the industry. And they took them all to the Woolworth building, which at that time was the third tallest building in the world, where they put them all on a vacant floor. Uh, and they, and, and a, a justice of the state Supreme Court came over and held bail hearings right there in the building. He denied bail to everyone. They were all held on material witness warrants. Uh, and they were locked up for the purpose of trying to get them to turn against higher-ups. Now, nowadays, we know that's what prosecutors do. You have to stretch your mind back. In the 1930s, this was a very controversial practice. There were a lot of people who believed in the 1930s that it was morally wrong to forgive someone a crime because they gave you evidence of what a higher-up had done. That was the position of significant elements of the mainstream bar. And so prosecutors didn't do that very often because they came in for a lot of criticism from, uh, from the bar. But that was Dewey's strategy. The short of it is that a not large of the women turned state's evidence. Turned, some of them actually overheard Dewey and his associates talking about organized crime, I mean, talking about prostitution. And they testified, four of them testified, and Luciano, I said Dewey, I meant Luciano. Luciano was convicted, the only crime that was ever proved um, against them, and of course, went to, uh, went to prison. Uh, so that was what my grandmother uh, did. And later in life, uh, that, that prosecution made her actually one of the most famous black women in the United States. There was not a time with a lot of famous black women in the United States. I don't think there was a lot of competition for that title. <laughs> Uh, but she was profiled in Life magazine and another magazine called Liberty, which at the time was the second highest circulation in the country. She was on the radio and on a television show, a couple of television shows. There weren't many television shows at the time, um, and other things uh, like that. Later in her career, she did a lot of other things. She and uh, Dewey were largely, in a sense, um, joined at the hip in the sense that when he ran for president, you have to have a little inversion that in the 1930s and 40s, the Democratic Party was the party of segregation, and the Republican Party was the party of civil rights. And in fact, in, part, in no small part due to Eunice's work, the Republican Party platform in 1944 had the strongest civil rights plank any party platform ever had. And when Dewey ran for president, she was out there campaigning uh, for him. And Dewey himself, in order to show his own lack of prejudice, talked about how he he by that time was the New York DA, and how the biggest bureau in his office uh, was run by a black woman, which is true. She supervised 70, as she was always, glee, or as the press was always gleefully saying, she supervised 70 white male lawyers, which no one had ever seen anything like that for a black woman at the time. And also, uh, the two families, hers and his, saw each other socially, uh, which he talked about on the stump as well to try to show his to civil rights. So that is the story of her and Luciano. But an equally interesting story. Uh, is where she got this fortitude from, who she was. And I'm going to let Leah talk about that for a few minutes and then do a couple of closing comments and then we'll take your, your questions. Your turn. All right. I'm not quite as experienced at this as my dad is, so I have some notes. So... Yeah, I'm going to talk about where this woman came from, this very remarkable woman. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't know anything about her except that she had been a prosecutor in New York and um, 
I knew that she had had a brother who was a communist who went to jail for refusing to name names in the 50s, which is another interesting element of her story. And that was it. Um, when I started doing this research, I learned that there was so much more to her story. And one of the things that was most interesting is um, not even just Eunice herself, but the background she came from. So the story starts as far, as far back as we've gone uh, with Eunice's grandfather, Stanton Hunton, who was um, enslaved in Virginia. Oh gosh, that just slipped my mind. I'm sorry, I got like, I have a four month old baby. I got literally <laughs> three and a half hours of sleep last night. <laughs> so yeah, sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so Stanton Hunton was enslaved in Virginia. He escaped from slavery three times and he eventually brought, bought his own freedom. He moved to Canada where he made a very successful life for himself but he actually returned home from Canada. He went to Mississippi, where his brother was enslaved, to buy his brother's freedom, which was an incredibly dangerous thing to do. The chances that he would be captured and re-enslaved were very high, but he made it back. Um, and he built a very successful life in Canada. He had several children, including Eunice's father, William, who, uh, my favorite detail that I think kind of explains something about William from his childhood is that Stanton used to make his kids do a lot of chores. And when there wasn't enough work for them to do, he would make the boys carry bricks back and forth across the yard. Just pick up, you know, piles of bricks, carry them across, pick them up, carry them back across, you know, so they would be disciplined and physically strong, I assume. Um, and so William grew up, he grew up in Canada, but he ended up returning to the United States. And he worked for the YMCA. And at the time, what William did was he opened what were called colored chapters of the YMCA. He started them all over the country. And he really believed, nowadays the YMCA is you know, like a place where when you swim, but um, at the time it was a much more important organization socially. And, he, and William was a devout Christian and he believed that having young men's Christian association chapters for black men was incredibly important uh, for the race. That, um, you know, that it would build Christian character for young black men and he thought that was very important. He was incredibly mission driven. He traveled all around the country going to several cities a week. Not always cities where it was particularly safe to go as a black man. Um, and basically William essentially worked himself to death. Um, he, uh, I spent a lot of time reading his letters uh, to his best friend, Jesse Moreland, which are kept at Howard. And you can see in the letters, he's constantly sick. He's constantly you know, having to slow down, but he doesn't want to slow down. He has to take a few extra days here to rest. And then he's, with all these diseases that sound really crazy nowadays, um, like malarial fever. And um, then he, but then he would keep going. And he actually spent very little time with his family um, because he, was con he loved his family very much, but he was, felt that it was incredibly important to do this work, and so he was constantly on the road um, traveling and starting these new associations. William's <sighs> wife, her name was Adelina, and uh, her maiden name was Adelina Lawton, and she uh, went by Addie, and um, she was also an activist. She spent a lot of time going around lecturing. A lot of her lectures were about the importance of black motherhood, that as a black woman, the most important thing you could do was be at home taking care of your children and bring them up for the next generation. Although Addie was rarely ever home with her children, she was always off <laughs> lecturing about this. <laughs> and, yeah. and so she, uh, she also did a lot of activism work with the NAACP and with the YMCA, and she spent a lot of time visiting different NAACP chapters, again, like William, in areas that were extremely dangerous, like going to speak and basically to raise people's spirits, to assure them that the NAA, you know, you're here in this small town with tons of lynchings, to ensure them that the NAACP hadn't forgotten them. Um, it was incredibly dangerous, but she did it because both she and William had this incredible fortitude and this incredible drive. They believed there was important work to be done and they were going to do it and nothing was going to stand in their way. So they had two children. They actually had other children who all died in infancy, but the two children they had who survived were Eunice, 
and her brother Alpheus, who was a few years younger. Um, his actually, William's full name was William Alpheus Hunton, and Alpheus was William Alpheus Hunton Jr., but everyone called him Alpheus. So Eunice, um, there's a story that when she was a small child, she was um, on the beach playing with another little boy she had met. And she told him that when she grew up, she wanted to be a lawyer. And the reason she wanted to be a lawyer was because she wanted to make sure that the bad guys went to prison. And which it turned out this is what she ended up doing. Um, but we think that what she may have been thinking about at the time was the Atlanta riots in 1906 when um, many of the white citizens of Atlanta decided that the black citizens of Atlanta had gotten a little too successful, a little too comfortable, and decided they were just going to burn all of their businesses and several of their homes down. And this was, the Hunton family was actually living in Atlanta when this happened. Eunice was seven years old. And uh, they moved to Brooklyn shortly after this. There is a story that may or may not have been true that um, the mob that was sort of rampaging, burning things down and attacking people stopped right before the Hunton's house. It seems that their house was spared. It's unclear whether, in fact, the mob violence actually stopped right next to their house. But, um, but they moved to Brooklyn after this. And, um, and then Eunice and Alpheus had this childhood where, as I mentioned before, their parent, both their parents were constantly gone. They were you know, always staying with various different friends of the family. And um, I think it, and they weren't even always together, Eunice and Alpheus. And I think this affected them in different ways. It's hard to know. There's, we don't have a lot of, we don't have any primary sources from the time of knowing how they felt. Um, but I know that he, they both grew up to be, in their own ways, incredibly strong and determined people. Um, so Alpheus, as I mentioned before, was a communist, um, like a real communist. Like he, you know, thought Stalin and Mao were really great. Um, and he did go to jail in the 1950s. Uh, rather than name names, and he he you know believed in which ruined his life after he got out of jail. He couldn't get work, and he ended up leaving the country a few years later. Um, he moved to Ghana, and he never came back to the United States. Um, but both, I think Eunice was more than the rest of her family. I think Eunice was personally ambitious. I think Alpheus, um, like both of his parents, was very mission driven. He wanted to, he, there was something that he thought needed to be accomplished, something that he thought was best for black people and he wanted to make sure that got done. And I think Eunice definitely had that feeling as well, but I think Eunice also wanted things for herself. She wanted to be recognized for herself. Um, and I think more so than the rest of her family, she had that personal ambition as well as sort of the drive to do good things for her community, uh, which I find very interesting about her. Um, and I think that she, I'm so sorry, I lost my train of thought. Again, three and a half hours of sleep. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> really great. Um, great. yeah, so yeah, I think that's actually where I wanted to end up. Um, so I will give the stage back to my dad. Briefly. <laughs> that was great. Uh -oh. Sorry, my microphone fell off. Um, so just a, a couple more points, and then I think we'll take uh, questions if, if you have them. Um, I, mean, I, think, I think Leah gave a good overview of the family's life. I should add that, that Alpheus being a communist, I mean, I said, as, as Leah said, he was a real communist. He was a high-ranking member of the party. His, his FBI file is 700 pages long, which to give you some perspective is about four times as long as Martin Luther King's FBI file and more than twice as long as W.E.B. Du Bois's FBI file. Uh, so that's just to give you a sense of, of, of what a big deal in the party uh, he was. And he and Eunice um, diverged not only in their politics, but they themselves began to grow apart roughly from the 1940s when um, their mother died. Uh, they grew further and further apart. <clears throat> and in 1951, when, as Leah told you, uh, Alpheus went to prison uh, for naming, not naming names, this is in the midst of the McCarthy uh, era, uh, and as a little footnote, this is one of the reasons that I'm 
myself have such a strong, uh, very strong commitment to freedom of speech and not shutting down dissent is precisely because of what my great uncle uh, went through. Here's a guy who had degrees from Harvard and NYU and Howard, but he had a, he had a master's from, uh, from Harvard and a, a PhD from NYU. He was multilingual. He was a Tennyson scholar. He wrote a wonderful dissertation uh, about Tennyson and the socialism in Tennyson's circle uh, at the time of his uh, um, uh, greatest um, uh, fame. Um, and after he went to prison, he couldn't get a job, as Leah said. He, he couldn't get a job in his field. Uh, he couldn't publish. He basically worked in a factory for a while, did a little freelance uh, writing, didn't succeed. He had to leave the country, not only because he couldn't, not only because he had political differences, because he couldn't get work. There was nothing, and, and so Du Bois invited him to come to Ghana to work with him on the Encyclopedia Africana, which he did. Uh, and 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 the th the thing is that in 1951, when he's hauled before a judge for contempt proceedings for refusing to name names. You might think he would turn to his sister. His sister was an experienced trial lawyer. By that time, she'd left the DA's office. She had a private practice in New York, where he might turn to his nephew, Eunice's son, by that time. My father had a law practice in New York and was doing extremely well. But he didn't. He didn't. Uh, and I think there's a reason he didn't, because he and Eunice basically weren't speaking, because it wasn't just that she didn't like his views, which was true. Um, she felt her, that he ruined her career that his communism ruined her career. The 700-page FBI file, think about that for a moment, and try to imagine an era when these things were kept on. But we're talking about an era, remember, when um, uh, tenured professors were being fired all over the country uh, for being communists. We're talking about an era when universities, including this one, refused to defend their faculty members who were accused of having these unpopular views. We're talking about an era where there's an actual academic blacklist where people couldn't get jobs anymore. We're talking about an era when people's posters and pictures were being taken down because they were communists, where things were being renamed because they were named after communists. You have to think of that era. And her ambition after the prosecutor's office was to become a judge. That was what one did in those days. And she always thought, because she would just tie it so closely to Dewey, who was her mentor, and she campaigned for governor for him. She campaigned for president for him. She went to black communities all over the country and also to white communities as well sometimes, speaking on his behalf. She thought she was going to be a judge. Um, and she never was. And she never was. And to her dying day, uh, she believed it was because of her brother. She could have blamed race. She could have blamed gender. But there were black judges, and there were female judges, and there were black female judges. But she wasn't one of them. In spite of all things she'd accomplished, she believed it was because her brother and his views had kept her from this. And so she held that against him. And from what we know, either never forgave him or didn't forgive him until very late in life. The two of them actually died uh, 10 days apart uh, in January of 1970. They both died of cancer. And by then, we at least know they'd started to correspond. Uh, but my father uh, used to say um, that after Alpheus went to prison, they never spoke again. And that was almost 20 years of life after that when they never spoke. And also, as Leah told you, Alpheus left the country. He never came back. He never came back. He lived in several different places in Africa. He traveled widely, especially to Russia and China. Uh, but he never came back to uh, the United States. Uh, as for Eunice, um, her career after she left the prosecutor's office just never worked out the way exactly that she'd expected it to not just with the judgeship, but with other things um, as well. She tried to reinvent herself as a kind of internationalist and joined a number of international organizations, including an umbrella organization for NGOs. And she was frequently elected to office in these things. She was the president of this one and treasurer of that one, and so on and so on. And that helped because she loved traveling the world. Uh, and yet I think that it was a part of her that always felt that she hadn't risen as high as she would have again. From our perspective, we might say a big part was because she's a black woman, but from her perspective, it was always that her brother was, uh, was a communist, was what she thought had held her, had held her back. I think we should stop there and take, uh, and take your questions. Oh. <laughs> and there's a question. Right. Professor Kennedy. <laughs> this is like a little conclave of Thurgood Marshall law clerks here. 
was her socialization to go to law? And then second, what was her relationship like with, you know, uh, Marshall, Hamilton, some of the other prominent black attorneys of the, of the year? Uh, so the first one I can answer clearly. The second one I can only answer a little bit. So she went to Smith College and she went to Fordham uh, Law School. If you look on a lot of various encyclopedias of black history, they'll tell you she was the first black graduate of Fordham. This is not true. The first black woman graduate of Fordham Law School. This is actually not true. Uh, she was the second one. Uh, but this is actually very significant. Uh, so she went to Fordham Law School in graduating in 1933. Um, at that time, most of the big law schools didn't admit women at all. And there was a phenomenon at the time that some of you may know historically called the women's law schools. There were law schools that grew up largely in the shadow. So there was a law school that grew up in the shadow of Harvard uh, a few blocks away that was licked just for a few years. I, don't remember the, I can't remember the exact name of it anymore, which is a law school just for women. The idea was to try to give an education like you get at Harvard since you probably weren't going to be going to Harvard. Um, but the other thing was the Catholic law schools. The Catholic law schools basically had a mission at the time. They educated women and people of color and immigrants and Jews, none of whom, by and large, could go to the big, uh, the big law schools. And the bar was furious about this. The bar took all kinds of measures to make it harder for those who went to the Catholic law schools, which served this population, uh, to become members of the bar. There are all kinds of additional restrictions they kept, uh, they kept adding. It was really a scandalous time. But you already, tried to shut them down. Yes. Well, exactly. So, so you know, the, the point is you, 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 well, my views about the organized bar become clear, so I don't have to go on, on and on uh, about that. I'm no fan. Uh, in any case, can I say that in this Sherman and Sterling classroom? Okay. Um, so that was where she went to law school. This is back in the time when people still use uh, the Keener and Wormser uh, casebook for contracts, by the way, which is the successor of the original Langdell casebook. And there were cases in there. There was a case about the silly Negro boy who, uh, who drove this cart into the river and various other things like that. There were several cases like that. So I, it's hard to imagine what it was like reading these cases in her contracts course. But remember, they were talking about the 1920s and, and, early, uh, and, and early 30s. Uh, now, uh, she and Thurgood Marshall uh, knew each other quite well. Um, the families uh, were close, and in fact, they were neighbors um, uh, for a while. The only connection I was able to find between her and Charles Hamill in Houston uh, was a couple of receptions, one of which she gave for him when he happened to be um, in, uh, uh, in New York. She corresponded with a number of other uh, black female lawyers at the time, particularly uh, Sadie Alexander, who was the kind of the you might say the dean of black women lawyers at the time. And Sadie Alexander actually wrote Eunice a lovely letter in which she said how impressed she was that Eunice had been promoted to the point where she was supervising a large staff of white men. She said nothing like this has ever happened before. And she was saying how exciting uh, she, thought, um, uh, uh, she thought that, that was. Um, again, the bar of the time was a male bar and a white bar. But even within the black bar, it was very much a male bar. We have some data in the book, which I can't call to mind automatically, of how the, the, the number of black women lawyers just in New York was basically a rounding error. Uh, it, it, was, it was such a tiny number. I can't remember the, the, off the top of my head. Other so, questions? So Ken, do you have, a, about Sadie Alexander, I wonder, we also have a, one of the world's leading experts on the Alexanders and on... Whose, whose book, by the way, I, 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 I used in writing this book. But. She is, she, and it's very, she's very deeply impressed because no, there, there are a bunch of other, I, I actually did have a question for you. There, there are very few other black women lawyers. Um, they, uh, they tend to, anyway, they, they, they tend to do sort of traditional women's work within the bar. But there's a, there are a few others in New York. So for instance, there's Ruth Whitehead Whaley, who is the first. Who, first graduate of, first black woman graduate of Fordham, yeah. Who's a very successful practitioner in New York. And I'm wondering, does, does she, she, she knew Jane Boleyn, um, I know, uh, from some records. And actually, you know, Eunice ran for the state legislature actually once before she went to law school and she lost. And two years later, Jane Boleyn ran for the same seat. Uh, they both ran as Republicans and she also, they both got 
creamed in the. Uh, uh, and, but I, I want to say a quick word about Ruth. So Ruth Whaler was the first black graduate of uh, black woman graduate of Fordham Law School, and there's an interesting story, a uh, part of which was misreported in the press, part of which the press got right when. So when she was and was graduating, you must know this story, Kim. When she was graduating, uh, she believed that she was entitled to a prize that was given by a book company for the highest grade on a particular test. And the prize went to a white male. And so Ruth Whaley complained that was supposed to be my prize. And the dean of the law school said, no, no, there's different criteria. It's really not your prize. No, I read the rules. It was supposed to be my prize. The book company said, we're not in this. This is for you to work out. She insisted it was hers. And the faculty of Fordham voted, this is 1924, you can look it up, that Ruth Whaley would not receive her degree, even though she finished close to the top of the class, she would not receive her degree until she withdrew her protest about this, this prize. That was what the faculty of Fordham decided. Uh, that is not in the official, uh, there's an official uh, history of Fordham Law School, which talk, goes on and on about black people and women, all these wonderful things. That story is not in the official uh, history, which I think is a terrible sin of them. She always talk about the, uh, the downside. Anyway, so eventually she got her degree, but this was a big issue. And what's interesting about it is that Whaley said that she, in being denied the prize, did not feel discriminated against the base of her race, but she did feel discriminated against the basis of her gender. That was Whaley's comment about that. Which reminds me, one other thing I wanted to mention about Eunice, um, before we take uh, more questions, uh, was that Eunice also, long before these were subjects that were much talked about in public, uh, talked about the way that men treated women, and particularly the way that men treated women in the workplace. Uh, in fact, she gave a speech in 1937 um, in which she said, among other things, um, she talked about men who used their positions I, I, to demand, I think she, she was using euphemism, I think she said intimate relations uh, from the women who worked for them. And she said, boiling in oil is a little too good for such men. And you have to, so this is an era where these subjects weren't being talked about and where, in fact, a lot of black civil rights leaders at the time worried that talking about women's rights would be a distraction uh, from the cause. But she was going around talking about this subject um, anyway. Do you want to talk about that? How come your dad didn't know her that well? Her home life, so. Do you want to come up here? We can share. Still being the dad. I don't remember actually how she met Lyle Senior. We think that they met when, we don't know for sure. I admit, that's why neither of us knows for sure. We think they met because uh, she was asked, this is back before she went to law school when she was a social worker, she was asked by Harry Hopkins at that time was, this is before the, FDR was in the White House and the FDR was uh, doing other things, but she, Harry Hopkins, who was basically running social services in New York, asked her to organize a Harlem dental clinic and he was one of the first volunteers. We think it's how they met only because that's the first record we find of anything associated with the two of them, but we don't know for uh, sure. But as for their home life, um, we don't think it was a very happy marriage uh, for most of it. Um, you said we don't think. Yes, no, no. we don't. <laughs> um, it, he was a philanderer, and um, they had one child, my grandfather, Lyle Carter Jr., uh, who, like Eunice, Eunice, you know, was raised by parents who were never around, and you think she was also a parent who was never around. Um, actually, for a big chunk of my grandfather's childhood, he was in Barbados, being raised by his uh, dad's family. His dad was from Barbados. And um, there was a story that he had been sent there for his own protection while she was working on the Luciano case, um, because there was a concern about you know, the security of the lawyers and the security of their families. But that doesn't seem to be true because he actually left before she started working for Dewey. Um, one possible explanation is that he went for his health. Um, 
that you know this was a time when you went to a nicer climate to you know deal with your sickliness as a child. Um, but it also might have been that she just you know she was she was very busy and uh, didn't really have time to take care of him nor necessarily have any sense of what to do with him while he was home. So um, yeah, it seems like it's possible that she just sent him away because you know her, her, that's what her parents did is they sent her to live with various family friends. Um, and yeah. The only thing I would add is that we don't as much as we'd like, but going back to the troubled marriage point, my father uh, used to say that his parents lived apart for a year. Uh, and I believe that, but we couldn't find any records to support it. I say records because in those times, the family was reasonably prominent in Harlem, and breakups in Harlem families were a big deal in the Negro press of the day. And we would have expected to see some mention in one of the gossip columns and couldn't find it. I'm not saying it didn't happen. My father said it happened. He was there. He was, I assume it did happen. But we couldn't date it exactly. Uh, it was only for a period of, of, uh, of time. Yeah, over here. I, I was hoping that you could speak to some of the elements you think are like long-lasting legacy. And clearly, lawyers in the family. And I don't know if it's going to be. I was just going to say. Keep going. The little one already spoken for. No, you should, you should talk My about mom that. actually thinks he's going to be a judge because of the way he sits sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering, outside of the family, if there are some of the long lasting effects of her legacy? Hmm. Interesting question. Like, is well, she I think. Remembered oh. in the office? Or, I mean, yes. people. So in the, um, there is a plaque for her in the uh, DA's office in Manhattan, which I actually haven't seen. I know you've seen it. That's right, you haven't seen it. I yeah, forgot. no, I've never been to see it. Um, it was, what year was it? I wasn't, I oh, was in college. Um, yeah, I think it was around 2010, maybe, something like that. I'm not sure. No, I think it was before that. Oh, you were in college. Yeah. So it was early in that. I don't know. In any case, yeah, something. there was a plaque. I was, my dad was there for the dedication. I wasn't. It was um, in, in olden times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> back in the day. Um, and you know, she is mentioned in some history books. Um, oh, on Boardwalk Empire. I haven't seen this, although I do intend to watch Boardwalk Empire. There is a black woman prosecutor, and apparently, at the time when this when she appeared, it was a very small role. I understand, but when she appeared. Um, People were like, what is this? There wouldn't have been a black woman prosecutor. That's ridiculous. You know, this is like crazy PC culture gone completely nuts. Um, but there was a black woman prosecutor at the time. And apparently the character on Boardwalk Empire, we had lunch with the creator of Boardwalk Empire who, who um, while we were working on this, and he told us that um, that character was based on my grandmother. She only had like two lines in the whole, she was like in two episodes, she had like two lines. And her name was Beatrice? I think her name was Beatrice, so, and he said that it was Beatrice because that's kind of like Eunice, and that's how he came up with the, with, uh, with the name. But it is true that the comment threads, what Leah just said, um, the, the fan pages were full of this is absurd, you know, there wouldn't have been a black woman prosecutor, and, and, and so on and so on. So if you watch Boardwalk Empire, <laughs> if you ever go back and look at that, it's in the final season or the next to last season. I can't remember. I don't remember how many seasons are. It's the next last season, next to last season. There are these two episodes this black woman prosecutor shows up, and that's. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, you clearly a woman of I'm sorry, can you speak a little louder? I apologize. Um, yeah, so the first person who springs to mind is uh, Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, mostly, I think, for me, because I spent a lot of my time uh, doing research on the National Council of Negro Women, um, and which is actually a whole other interesting area of Eunice's story. Um, so this is where a lot of my sense of Eunice came from reading the letters of the National Council of Negro Women, um, reading her letters to people, um, which is where I learned that she was very persistent, I guess, 
Uh, she was so just like my dad was saying when she was working for Dewey, and she had this prostitution angle that he wasn't interested in. She kept bringing it and bringing it to his attention until he finally acted on it. And um, when she would in her work for the National Council of Negro Women, she was on the um, executive board for several years, and she would if there was some issue that she thought was important about you know the way the club was being run she would keep bringing it up and bringing it up whether people wanted to talk about it or not if you know she'd bring it up and be like i think this is important people are like no you know and i didn't always have all of the letters so sometimes i would just have a few letters from her in which she kept bringing something up and clearly the other person wasn't interested even though i didn't have their letters um, but she just kept pushing um, and i think this was a personality trait that alienated her from a lot of people and in the end um, she actually was alienated from Bethune as well, but for a long time Bethune was a big, Bethune had also been a friend of her mother's, um, but she was a big supporter of hers and they were, were very close for many years. Um, so yeah, she's the first person who springs to mind as a uh, supportive woman in her life. And in fact, she thought that, uh, Eunice thought after she left the prosecutor's office that when Bethune retired, she, Eunice, would become head of the National Council of Negro Women, which in those yes. days was perhaps a bigger deal than it is now. I don't know, but, um, and the newspapers thought she would too, but she and Bethune had a falling out, and she never did. But there's also her mother we talked about, who was a strong influence in her life. There's other one I want to mention, I was a woman named Mary White Ovington, of some, whom some of you may have heard. Mary White Ovington was a graduate of Smith. She was a feminist and a socialist and extremely wealthy. She probably paid Eunice's way through college. Um, and in any case, she had been very close to Eunice's mother. And so when Eunice was in college, um, Oven had a house nearby that was often used for conferences and so on with a library. And when there was no conference going on, then Eunice kind of had the run of the, of the house. So that's another woman who was extremely influential um, uh, in, uh, in her life. So Steve, can you say a little bit about the role of uh, how she experienced race and gender in the legal profession? I mean, it's interesting. You've talked a lot about how she thought a lot of things weren't because of that. So for example, did she actually, for example, appear in the courtroom during the trial? Did she mm. take witnesses? Did, did her race ever come up or her gender ever come up in the context of the, the I'm, work that I'm she glad did? you asked that question. So a couple of quick points about the trial and then <laughs> see if Leah wants to <laughs> add anything. Um, so I told you that she came up with the legal theory on which uh, uh, Lucky Luciano was successfully prosecuted and that also, it was the only crime he was ever convicted of. Um, she also assembled all the evidence, including all these charts that you can find in the records linking this and that aspect of it. Did an enormous amount of work. What a time came try, time to try the case, it was Dewey and three white male assistants who tried the case. A couple of years later, um, Dewey decided to go after Jimmy Hines, who was the Tammany Hall leader, one of the, possibly the most powerful man in New York at the time, uh, who had connections. Uh, to the mob. Once again, uh, Eunice did most of the work, assembled most of the, uh, of, of the evidence, uh, got witnesses to turn. And once again, when it came time to try the case, Dewey selected a couple of white male assistants to try the case. I don't want to suggest that Eunice didn't go to court. She went to court a lot. Um, so for example, a, a year after the Luciano case, a year after Luciano's conviction, there was a hearing uh, in New York about whether to overturn it because uh, the four women who had testified against him uh, all submitted affidavits saying that their testimony was perjured, that they'd been pressured by the DA's office. Um, and so there was a hearing, and, and, and Eunice was one of the lawyers who went to that, that hearing because she had knew all and had interviewed all these women. And uh, the judge basically dismissed it. He said these, these affidavits were perjured, indeed, one of the women. Uh, said later that she told one of the women told another one of the women, if you'll sign one of these affidavits, you can get all this money, you know. And and they did get a lot of money from the mob apparently, and the payment stopped after the motion was um, uh, was rejected. So she did have uh, these problems, of course, being directed into looking at the prostitution in the first place was something that was clearly, well, somebody's got to do it. It's not going to be one of the white men. They're working important stuff like loan sharking and murder, as I said, and. And, and so on. So she was the one who was, who was assigned to this task um, uh, instead. And I, I didn't say that um, that other things went wrong in Eunice's career were not uh, based on race and gender. That was Eunice's yes. 
view. I want to make that clear. The only, one, only thing I want to mention is that her mother, Addie, when she resigned from the NAACP, um, she'd been having trouble before that. She wrote a letter to Mary White Ovington in which she talked about how at that time, she was the only female field secretary. The, the field secretaries of the people literally went out and did the things that Leah was talking about, went out to the Klan country basically by themselves and tried to rouse these branches. Um, and, and she talked about, to Mary Red Ovington, she wrote a letter that says, how I miss you, because Ovington had been on the board of the NAACP for years and was now um, on in years, and I think she wasn't very active anymore. How I miss you when I come in from the field. It's so wonderful to have another woman to talk to, um, wrote her mother, Addie. Also when her mother Addie resigned from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which was a big, uh, uh, for those of you who know this history, it, it was a big organization of basically radical left women in the 19, well, from the 1910s and 20s and 30s. Uh, that was over a sense that, uh, she, that within the organization there was racial uh, discrimination, that she as a black woman was being discriminated against. Addie was involved in a number of suffragist organizations also. Uh, which she ended up mostly leaving, indeed, when Inez Milholland, the great suffragist, had her, uh, had her funeral. Um, uh, she and Addie had been very close, uh, and she had apparently wanted Addie to speak, uh, but when Addie got there, they wouldn't let her speak, uh, which was a big to-do, which was written up, actually, in the NAACP uh, newsletter, and so on. So her mother experienced these things, and I assume she must have shared stories with her her daughter. Anything you want to add to? Um, no, I think that's a good answer. Yeah, I would add, yeah, it seems like she did get, she got a decent amount of work to do on the Luciano trial. As you said, she did appear in court and she appeared on behalf of the DA's office in smaller hearings, um, even though she did not appear in the actual trial. True. Yeah, I should have um, mentioned that. Yeah. There's also just a funny story about the trial, although we couldn't find any evidence. Um, I couldn't find any evidence for it in the DA's office, um, that she, during the trial, one of the witnesses um, who uh, was one of the prostitutes who was testifying against Luciano um, was, she was, it seems like she was going through withdrawal um, from cocaine, um, and she- While she was on the stand. Well, yes, while she was on the stand, she was going through withdrawal. And um, I guess she was, you know, her nerves were kind of shot and she was acting kind of erratic, and so, the uh, defense counsel at one point accused her of being high while she was on the stand and demanded that she be tested for drugs. And so the judge uh, ordered that she be tested for drugs. And so they took her off the stand into a back room. Um, and there's a story that Eunice went with her uh, because she was a woman. And She's the only but, woman lawyer in the courtroom. They yeah, said. but we couldn't find, or I couldn't find yeah. um, anything about that. Yeah, it wasn't reported in the papers anywhere that it's asserted in a book about Luciana, but with no footnote or anything like that. So it, it may be, as you say, maybe we couldn't, yeah. um, but we couldn't um, uh, prove it. Yeah. And then she was declared drug free and testimony was allowed. By the way, that that the, the that, that witness who's Koki Flo Brown, isn't that Koki Flo Brown? The judge also allowed her three different times in her testimony to take oh. a sip of brandy to calm her nerves <laughs> while she was testifying. And that was the headline the next day in both the uh, New York Times and the New York Herald Tribune was that this about this witness drinking brandy while she was on the uh, on the witness stand in the Lucky Luciano trial. I, I should add that also in the trial, uh, one of the jobs Eunice was, was generally charged with the welfare of these women and organized apartments and stay in and police protection and, uh, uh, and, and so on. Well, listen, as you can see, this is a totally fascinating story to, about a family told by incredibly fascinating members of that family. Steve uh, and uh, Leah, I hope, will sit around and uh, sign books, which we have out here, which I really hope you will buy. I'm going to ask them to sign my book first. Uh, so I hope that will be modeling behavior for the rest of you. Uh, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this, and I hope that uh, really you'll, I think that to answer the question, we don't know enough about the incredible people who did things like this. You know, we're not talking the 18. Or mm. things, you know, we're yeah. talking within the living memory, or at least the almost living memory of people, and and we should remember them, especially here at Harvard Law School, where, as you said, I think there are not enough uh, 
role models and heroines that we can look to and hold up to. So thank you for bringing this to light. Thank you for making the journey from that other place in Connecticut. And uh, we hope you'll come back. It's it our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Darrell. You were wonderful. That was wonderful. That was wonderful.